Good evening, and welcome to the Mound Science and Energy Museum Association Seminar Series on September 23rd, 2020. This evening, we are uh, hosting a, a prior presentation by Dr. Don Solinger on the beginning of the Mound uh, Museum uh, Association. And so, this was a presentation originally presented in 2018, and I'm going to bring up. So here we are uh, with the uh, title page of the of tonight's seminar. Uh, the Manhattan Project occurred to develop the atomic bomb during World War II, and it was a major uh, program. And the role of the Dayton Project. Uh, operated by Monsanto Chemical Company in Dayton, Ohio, was a key player. Uh, in July of this year, we gave an overview presentation of the Manhattan Project, outlining the overall program. Uh, it, it's been recorded at, on our uh, YouTube site, so if you're interested, here's an opportunity to see the big picture of, of the development of the atomic bombs during World War II. And the reason for uh, bringing it up now is that the Mound Laboratory was actually started by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1946 as a follow-on to the Manhattan Project. And the uh, role was to develop uh, components for, for nuclear weapons. And so it was all classified, highly secret. People didn't really know what was, was going on uh, for many years. This is the uh, aerial view of the uh, Mound Museum just about after the construction was finished in 1948. And you can see the, the facilities and parking lot. Over the next 40 years or so, the role of the Mound Laboratory expanded greatly, not only in, in we nuclear weapons, but in space power system, uh, chemical uh, uh, energy techniques, and a, a wide variety of of activities. However, uh, with the end of the Cold War, the Department of Energy decided to consolidate many of the facilities, and one of them that was closed was the Mound Laboratory. Now, the impact in the local community was very large, and this graph shows as uh, a function of time from the uh, Manhattan Project uh, start at the Dayton Laboratory up until the final closure around 2003 and the uh, reclamation, the number of employees. And you'll see that uh, in the 1970s through the uh, 1990s, there were 2,000 or more employees working on various uh, projects at the, at the Mound site in Mimesburg. Uh, at the uh, closure of the facility, there was an effort to uh, begin a museum to recall all that and all the work that was done. Don Solinger was a, was a key uh, player, and tonight's seminar is a summary of what happened there. Now, let me introduce Don. He holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Colorado and a PhD in physical chemistry from Cornell University. Don was a member of the technical staff at Mound starting in July of 1962 until August of 1992. Well, with no further uh, delay, let's uh, have Don's presentation start. And I, uh, at the end, we'll come back and have a little summary for you. Uh, please watch the presentation now. Uh, I'll be covering roughly 1998 to 2012. I was here at the beginning. I'll be talking about that in a minute. In 1998, we started, and I worked, practically lived here for uh, until 2012. I had a son who suffered a dramatic brain injury, and I had to quit uh, this effort here in order to take care of him a little more intensively in 2012. So this is, I call it the Early Mound Museum effort. It started in August 1998. Mr. Flitcraft came to one of our 
the uh, luncheon meetings at noon over at uh, Ryan Caf Cafeteria in Kettering at, uh, on Stroop Road. And he asked for volunteers to start a uh, museum effort here. There were four of us who were very eager to do this. So uh, myself, Jeff Mel, Marge Harlenstein, and Maxine Vest. Uh, got on his top of his list, and we started out the uh, effort to set up a museum for for Mount, and the date project we preceded it. The, the agreement was that MMCIC, the Mount uh, Miami, Miami Square Community Improvement Association, which is in charge of cleaning this place up, uh, would help us out with. Uh, Lots of uh, support, encouragement, and a little money. So, Mike Garwellman was the president of MMCIC. Here's here's four of us. We were a little younger at the time. In fact, we were a bit younger than we were when we volunteered. <laughs> so, myself, Jeff Bell, Marge, and Maxine. The initial meetings we had, we uh, uh, Jeff Nell had a nice uh, meeting room uh, that we could all gather in. So we had, oh, I'd say the first three or four we had in her home at, on, uh, in Centerville. And then after that, NMCIC found us various places to meet. Uh, there was a, we met at uh, the COS conference room <coughs> over here. OS East Cafeteria, these are the old groups <laughs> for these places. Uh, the OS East Lobby, it met the Dayton Credit Union uh, Community Room, and uh, uh, Building 102 Conference Room uh, up here. Uh, and th then we met at uh, GH Building, which had a, a, a kind of a nice conference room. <coughs> I was selected. Uh, to chair of the volunteer group. Jeff Mel said it was penance for never taking a managerial job while I was working for a while. So, uh, anyhow, that was my first <laughs> management job. <laughs> and several other bound retirees, I'll mention a few of them. One is here in the front row. Uh, to the Grove, Ken Foster, <laughs> Ruby Clark, Ken Phipps. Rob Robinson, Dan Gorman, Hertrix Vada. These are the ones I can remember. There are probably a few more that I haven't added here. And, and one of the first things we did is MMCIC donated us some funds uh, to buy a, a few cheap uh, voice recorders. And we were going to record people's thoughts. That went a little ways, but it didn't. It, it never seemed to persist very much. We didn't record too many, but we could see uh, very soon that we needed more volunteers. So we tried to get people or call for volunteers for cataloging, repairing, and organizing the acquisitions we had. We were uh, to, to contact, interview these people who were going to record and design a set of exhibits, give presentations, and do publicity. We did get quite a few volunteers, and uh, so we created what we call the Mount Museum Association, MMA, in early 2000. And uh, we opened the membership to the general public, even though it's always been uh, overwhelmingly bound, and, uh, former Mount employees and, uh, or uh, uh, Dayton Project employees. It was open to the general public and we charged a great sum of $10, uh, $10 a year. Ken Foster volunteered to be our membership chairman, so we were off and running. And in August two, by August 2002, we'd grown to a membership of 79. We started getting acquisitions and so we worked on a routine procedure with Sue Smiley, who was with the DUE, see I hit that, 
Uh, she was working with the DUA, Donna Gallagher, who was the, the cleanup contractor, which at that time was BWXTO. And uh, they worked on a routine, so we were transferring things for the DOE uh, by way of MMC as an intermediary. Actually, they requested them for us and they'd give them to us or for, charge us a dollar or something like that. Uh, sometimes it's better than what it was, sometimes it was uh, incumbent upon them to charge us a little sum or some great sum like a dollar to, And this might be anything, some, something that uh, might be a set of books, might be some uh, uh, gadget that we retrieve from the junk pile or what, but we, it was useful to us. And then the, we acknowledge these uh, from individuals with a description note of things. And uh, we collected these in, in uh, DS building room 201, which NMC IC donated for us to use uh, to collect our uh, acquisitions <coughs> in. Well, the first things we got was uh, we got two uh, <coughs> units uh, RTG units that we had given some years before to the Armstrong Space Museum when it was uh, first set up. They weren't using it at the time. Mr. John Zwei, who was the president of that, uh, saw somewhere and noticed that we were starting a museum, so he called uh, someone, one of us, and, and said he had these things and we could come and get them. So what it was, one was a Snap 27 fuel capsule. It was a, it was a cutaway uh, uh, unit that uh, it was identical to the one that was left on uh, the moon by the Apollo 11 crew to uh, keep the uh, uh, <coughs> instruments running uh, after the astronauts left. And the second unit was a, was a can of a radio isotop heater. We didn't have the heater in there, but it was a can of Apollo 11 left there. This was to keep the seismic unit uh, going so it wouldn't freeze up in the two-week uh, lunar night. So it was nice to, these are the first things we got. About that same time, Ken Jordan sent uh, 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 Marge Hallenstein, what he called a color to number 24. And this has been given to him when he retired and after they were moving it around a lot. His wife said, get this out of here. <laughs> and so they sent it to us and we were glad to get this. It turned out this has been a very accurate instrument and it had been very important in the development of color images. So that, another acquisition. Here's a couple picture of a couple other things we got very early. Uh, John Bradley had been uh, uh, the health physics uh, uh, unit head at uh, Unit 4, the Runnymede Playhouse, and when he retired, he was given this doorknob that was preserved here. Uh, uh, there were two of them preserved. One of them went to some museum in, in, in Washington, uh, and he was given the other one. Uh, he sent this to Ken Foster, and that was added to the collection. This is a, a piece of glass that was in the roof of the greenhouse at the, at the uh, uh, Running Mead Playhouse or Unit 4. It was uh, a relatively low uh, radiation, and it, and it, so it was one of the pieces that was. Uh, buried here on the mound site, and in the course of cleaning up here, they dug up some of the stuff. So we managed to get a few pieces of that as the genuine uh, 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 rooftop from Unit 4. And then about the same time, this is David Scott. Let uh, us have, there were four folders that were, uh, of photos that were prepared by the staff. Of, Mr. Scott when he retired, and uh, to show you how we weren't used to uh, asking for too much, I asked for two of them and got Jane Greenwald of BWXGO to copy these. 
Well, there were four of them. <laughs> so I, I, I got those so easy. I, I went back and got the other two myself. I, I was getting more used to this, uh, asking for things. And Ron Robinson went through them. And he was still working uh, with security and uh, some uh, contracts still on security. And he cleared them for us, and we added those to collection. About this same time, we got some word from Bill Curtis, who is the uh, daughter, of, uh, who's the son of Mary Lou Curtis, who uh, I'm sure most of people who worked here a long time knew of Mary Lou. She, she was one of the real pioneers here and became a, a great authority on uh, radiation measurement uh, instrumentation, particularly alpha radiation. And she had been interviewed by her son, Bill, uh, Bill taught a TV production at a college in Kansas, and he, uh, so he was coming to this area to a family reunion in northern Kentucky. He uh, <coughs> called and asked someone, I think, again, I, uh, Ken Foster was the contact person for most people in the early days here. And I think they talked to him, and anyhow, Jeff Nell agreed to coordinate uh, uh, getting a group together, and Bill was going to interview them in a free-for-all interview where they talk about uh, w uh, what working life was at the, at the Dayton Project in the Mount. He, he had interviewed his mother in 1994 and 1995, about a, an hour each. So he his proposal was to take snippets from her conversation that he'd recorded and put it with uh, the free-for-all that we managed to get here and, and put it together some, with some editing, uh, a couple of DVDs on what life and work at, at both the Dayton Project and Mount were like. And he did this. And uh, so Jeff and Al got together. She got pe seven people to uh, agree to do this. And I was uh, noticing here, it seems to me, uh, I saw Warren a few minutes ago. It looks to me like you're the only one left out of this group, Warren. That uh, the uh, uh, Claude Hudgens, Dr. Reagan, Gus Essig, Ray Hertz, George Bafus, Kevin Foster, and Warren Sheehan. And this was just a free for all, but somebody got started talking and it was. And someone else would say, well, it reminds me of something else. And they went on for three hours. <laughs> and, and Bill recorded all this, and then he edited it and uh, put it together in two DVDs. He gave us some copies of those. And, he, and actually, I've seen some part of it has been recorded on YouTube, even. And, and uh, uh, also, he gave some copies later to Cynthia Kelly of the uh, uh, Atomic uh, organiza uh, Organization that she set up in Washington. So we were gradually acquired things, and that's just a rough note of this. By the end of 2000, this was just a count of uh, we had some 1,500 documents, letters, reports, and so forth. We had uh, 22 different collections or groups of photographs, and then there were some 85 articles. We had eight videotapes, and uh, there's 35 other uh, miscellaneous things. So our collection was growing. It wasn't very big there, you can see. But that was just the end of 2000. Now, we decided to incorporate their advantages to incorporate the Mount Museum Association. So on May 26, we accomplished that, and we used the services of Mr. Tom Lubers, who was the uh, to draft the corporation and gain its approval. This was uh, given to us, supported by MMCIC. Oops. I want to mention a couple people that uh, were non-bound uh, employees. 
and uh, they helped us out a great deal. One was Floyd Hardwick. He was uh, given about three jobs uh, when he was hired here, among other things was to, he was a, uh, a cleanup contractor employee and he was designated historian and he, one of the jobs is, was to write this mount site process history. So he ended up with a big pile of stuff that was together and uh, he published this in 2000. There's, uh, he complained that he didn't know much about it, but he did get access to about everything. So he got a number of uh, MMA people and some others to look it over to try to catch errors, and there's still some errors in it, but the, in the, it's published. But uh, it, was quite, it was quite an effort he did, and, and in the process of collecting all this stuff, and he was, had clearance and was able to get to see everything, while well, most of us didn't have clearance at the time. So he also made uh, uh, contacts, and these, these two, Skip Gosling and Terry Fainer, were DOE historians that he worked with quite a lot, and they spent some time here with us, so we, we made some contact with them. Then he, he also wrote and distributed a quarterly newsletter for us, which was a great help. And he, he must have been here 10 or 12 years, and I sort of lost uh, I was going to try to check on that, but I thought I'd say roughly 10 or 12 years. And uh, when he finally got laid off as they shrunk the workforce, uh, he got a job as a, a cleanup contractor that was cleaning up Fort Monmouth. Fort Monmouth was a long time embarkation point for Europe, both in the First World War and the Second World War. It was, was being closed down. And they want somebody to write a history, history of it, similar to what had been done here. So uh, Floyd got that job, and I was that was oh that was must have been 15 years ago when he left, and, and uh, he uh, uh, I I had some contact with him afterwards, and I would say up to about two years ago he was still there but he was about to retire. Another uh, non-bound employee who helped us out a good deal was Bob Morris, who I met in a uh, CompUSA store over at the Cross of the Mall. He was a Mac enthusiast, so we got along pretty well. And uh, uh, he had worked for Comcast in the Detroit area for quite a lot. He was a graphic artist and knew an awful lot about electronics. He had personal problems that seemed to involve him all the time, so it was a kind of a turbid uh, experience we had with him in a certain respect, but he did uh, advise in the purchase of a, a big Mac computer. We still have a large external hard disk. So we still have most of this equipment. And he had the first projection equipment system we had here. And he produced several DVD recordings of monthly meeting. His idea, which is a good idea, was to, to cut the speech, to, to uh, film the speech as it's given by the presenter and to cut it in appropriate places and interweave the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, actual tape with the slides in it. And we did a few, uh, two or three like that, but we, he didn't stay with us long enough and nobody else was capable of doing that to the extent he did. So we never got any of those done. But uh, uh, one, of, one of them we did get done that way and it's, it's been one of the best DVDs made here, I think, was the talk that Betty Halley gave uh, with, uh, uh, and the slides that she showed, that it was, that's the way we wanted to do the DVDs. He also produced uh, a talk where there weren't slides by Mr. Flintcraft gave about his experiences here. Dr. Regan gave one, and I think George Moffat has been the first time he gave a talk, was, <laughs> he didn't use slides. 
anyhow, he just recorded those. I think there are copies of those still floating around somewhere. He also produced an appropriate logo for the MMA to use, and he set up a website that we had initially. Uh, and uh, like I said, he quit working because of intervening personal problems. Yes, this is the right side of the logo he made, and we use this quite a lot for this uh, stationery and for other things. Uh, in 2002, uh, we were convinced by some of the uh, people who had had some experience with this outfit, Orange Boy. They had uh, helped in the setting up the Experience Center here downtown that Debbie Gill ran for a while. Debbie Gill was the wife of John Gill, who was a long time employee here now. But she, she ran the experience center. She had had experience with this orange boy. It was to help set up and to establish long-term strategic plans and so forth for particular nonprofit organizations. So during 19, 2002, and we got the, I put down the uh, date there, 12, 17, 2002, we, we got the, they worked most of that year. And, and, on 12-17-2002, they gave us the final report of their strategic plan. This was their logo. And uh, their proposal was that Mountain try to become a, uh, a regional museum devoted to the nuclear age, which they called 1895, the discovery of radioactivity, to 2000, the date then. Uh, 2003, and they illustrate this with Bound's work legacy. And uh, then they wanted the MA to position itself as a learning institution that sought to maintain the nuclear relevance in contemporary time. So these are all uh, encouraging things to do. MMA would have the mission of curatorial oversight of the Mountain Collection, try to inform the public about this collection support the Mount Legacy, uh, Mount Plant Legacy Management here as a uh, action. They even uh, helped us write a vision for the MMA to interpret the nuclear age through the lives of working in communities of Mount employees. Some of this stuff has stayed on, but these were the long uh, term, these are proposals they made one is they were very much enamored with tea building, and they wanted the museum, they urged the museum to actually move to tea building to, to sort of fix it up and have our uh, actual uh, uh, museum centered there and to, to make that the core of everything. We should, they said we should quickly assemble a startup fund for at least $100,000 the next year. These are the things that we didn't accomplish. And they wanted us to retain a project manager, a manager to guide the development of the project and commission our curator or work, not try to do it ourselves. Uh, and they wanted us, urged us to develop a capacity for a 15 million capital campaign. Well, you can see what the difficulties were. It's, it's accomplishing it. See, you're pretty big big uh, uh, bites to chew off, so we never uh, uh, managed to do a good bit of this. So this their proposals sort of lay in the background there, we never accomplished anything like this in the magnitude of it. Also at the same time, it's all along with it, and somewhat in the background, sometimes in the foreground, there was a, an effort that it started some years before even to set up a national historic park for to commemorate the Manhattan Project. And the, the aviation park people here, the national park people, uh, were very interested in this. And so they swung behind this Manhattan Project historical park study and, and got mound uh, included along with uh, uh, 
uh, Oak Ridge, Hanford, and Los Alamos as the fourth uh, entity in, in a proposed national park. And uh, uh, the people, Larry Blake was the head of the, uh, the Dayton Aviation Heritage National Historical Park. He was the head of it. Tim Gooders, the assistant, Ed Roach was a historian, and Ann Honius was a, uh, an education expert. So we visited, they made arrangements, and we visited uh, uh, the personnel who were then in control of the four date sites. And uh, all the stakeholders around, we, we interviewed. I spent a lot of time with them going around talking to various people who either owned this property at the time, like the Unit 3 was on the Dayton School Board, and it was sitting, uh, they did tear down the main building, but the, all the outlying uh, uh, additions to it that were uh, uh, you know, trailers or trailer additions that uh, and, and other temporary buildings were still there, and they still are right now. Uh, the uh, unit one had gone at that time was uh, as a subsidiary of uh, Dupont that had uh, owned unit one at the time. The warehouse at, at East First Street uh, had got was a private uh, local contractor. He was interested in developing something. But anyhow, we talked to all these people and found the status of that and tried to get them behind, to get behind the, the National Park effort. We also wrote, uh, I wrote to the local congressional delegation, uh, Congressman Turner, uh, uh, Hobson, Boehner had just become uh, uh, I, I think I think he was a speaker by that time, and and uh, the senators were Voinovich uh, and DeWine, and uh, we were trying to get them to support this national park effort with Dayton included as one of the units of it. Well, uh, <clears throat> the only one who really gave us any significant support was. Gawain, who was a, a senator at the time, and he uh, had a, a colloquia that is a, a sort of a, they talked it back and forth in, on the congressional uh, uh, floor, and he tried to get Senator Binghamton, who was one of the uh, sponsors of the bill, told him about it, and anyhow, that's where it lay, but this, kicked around for about another 10 years. And actually, the National Park was established only in 2015. By this time, because we could not, essentially could not get any uh, sufficient support among the movers and shakers, including our congressman, we didn't ever heard back from Turner, even though I wrote it three times. And uh, some other people did, so we could, we couldn't get congressional support locally. Uh, uh, the movers in Shaker, like the Dayton Foundation and so forth, didn't really get by it enough. So uh, Dayton fell off the <laughs> end of the list. We were not included in the, 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 the three units of the National Park that was finally established in 2015 had Los Alamos, uh, Hanford, and Oak Ridge, the three big ones. Uh, so we took several trips at that time, MMA did, and uh, the, I listed some of them here. We went to uh, George Bonfus and I went to uh, a meeting in 2004 and I called the Manhattan Project in Elmira, New York. Ken Phipps went to uh, represent Dayton at the DOE Museum Visitor Conference in Las Vegas. Jeff Allen, George uh, uh, Monfus went to this second Manhattan Project family reunion in Oak Ridge. And he was, George gave a talk there then. And Phipps represented Bound again in 2008 at the 
uh, Atomic Heritage Foundation events Oak Ridge. And then Frank Lonadier and I had a took a display to UD. To, it was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of Sputnik at UD. And the thing that was, was kind of unusual about that is that the scientific attaché from Russia came there, and he was at this uh, meeting. And, and I know Frank and I both shook hands on it. We had some uh, rather important business about. These are a few of the Lyndon Thomas Turgeon, who was the granddaughter of Charles Thomas, came here a couple of times. And, uh, and she was here in 2005, the first time, and she finally got her book published on, on the Dayton Project last May. Uh, Michael Vicchio, who headed up this group called the Children of the Manhattan Project, is one of the uh, uh, organizations that supported this. And there was a guy named John Kostermann who wrote a very detailed uh, description of uh, uh, both the atom bombs, that is the unclassified thing. He contacted all these, every time he heard about some uh, mention uh, of one or the other, the, atomic, the actual atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. He contacted the people and got what he could, and he put these into a book. It's kind of interesting. We have a copy of this book. I have a copy of this book, I think. I think the, the organization did have one. And uh, they both spoke at it. It was the uh, 60th anniversary of the Hiroshima bomb raid at, at uh, 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 Wright Pad, and they came here the next day, so we showed them around this. They, they had never heard of the Dayton Project and uh, were very interested. They promised to give us some uh, publicity, but uh, it, uh, unfortunately, Michael Vicchio got leukemia Oh, I'd say six months or so afterwards. And he died very quickly after it was discovered, and most of his stuff he got was uh, was uh, folded over into this. Sidney Kelly had a this uh, Atomic Heritage Foundation in Washington D.C., which has been the most successful uh, organization. She's still going in the big way. She's gotten a good deal of money. And it's the one who's probably most responsible for getting the national park set up. She's a she's a tough fighter. <laughs> uh, uh, anyhow, she ended up with most of the stuff that Pinkia had and his group had collected. And uh, Ch uh, Mayor Church came here a couple of times and interviewed uh, several of us. So we had some contact with the outer world. Uh, now. Uh, as a sort of review, here's the first three elections we had. We were supposed to have these every two years, and you notice we made it about every three years. That was, I was the first president, Jeff Bell was the vice president, Foster the treasurer, Wanda secretary, and then there were nine trustees. I have the list of them, I didn't write them up here. Uh, Frank Lonadier became president in 2005, Jeff Bell was the vice president, Foster the treasurer, Wanda was secretary again, and the trustee. Then in July uh, 2008, Mr. Flintcraft became president. Uh, uh, Paul Lambert was vice president. Ed Phipps, uh, treasurer, and Wanda DeGroat was the secretary. Again, there was some overlap with these trustees. There were a few people like, uh, who I think like Ken Foster who survived all of them. Anyhow, that was our first three elections, and we had, uh, I know there have been at least one more election since then, but Mr. Flitker changed things around quite a bit, and I had to quit about in uh, early 2012, so I won't say much more about it. We moved, the MMA moved to GH building in early 2003, and uh, we set up these, uh, public times and also work times on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And uh, uh, we had no paid employees, we still own. Uh, historical technical uh, 
public meeting like this one here. We set this up. That's perhaps been the most successful thing, I think, that the, the museum has done, that these are persisted. And at the time I left, I counted them up. There were 55 uh, uh, that had occurred up to the time I quit in 2012. And I, you've kept them up since. Uh, one, one of the couple of other collections I'll just mention briefly is we got a, some very interesting things from uh, John Burton when he retired. One is uh, an actual business, I'll show you this. This is a business slug that was actually used like this is like this is a business that's in an aluminum can and these the end caps. This was what was actually is about four inches long. They were actually what was inserted uh, in the pile at first at Oak Ridge and then at Hanford when the Hanford pile was go uh, operational. And uh, this is a business and, and as uh, uh, neutrons penetrate, the pile penetrated through the aluminum can and, and formed uh, uh, polonium through a, a process of, of uh, radiation degradation and this the, so this had to be extracted from this that was the job of the main one well, of the main job of extraction to obtain polonium for uh, use in the uh, urchins uh, here's this was uh, once it was obtained the it was electroplated inside these tubes this tube were either, sometimes they use tantalum, sometimes they use polonium. This was uh, usually quartz or sometimes uh, a glass ampule with a, a argon uh, 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 atmosphere inside here. This was the shipping container that was actually used to ship the polonium to uh, Los Alamos to actually make the urchin during the war. Later this was transferred back to uh, uh, the Dayton Project in the later years. It was actually, those urchins were actually made in, in the Dayton Project. Uh, Howard DeFore, who seemed to have been everywhere, uh, both NCR uh, and Bound, and uh, the, he helped establish the uh, uh, Instrument Lab at Wright State and, uh, and, and a couple other places. He gave us uh, uh, a lot of quartz microbalance material. He gave us a, a, a full unit and a lot of a lot of these component parts here. And uh, <clears throat> so we have quite a collection that he, that he gave us. Uh, the oh. We also, about this time, got the, the remnant of the Mountain Library. It, it did two reductions before he got it, but it was about 20 boxes of material. And that was the core of the library that was here when I left. I'm not sure what's happened to that yet. Now, uh, also the MLM, MLMs, we got uh, in May about the same time acquired uh, the uh, it's, uh, in 2003 we acquired the, the photographic negatives that the photographic group at Mount had. This is a nice collection. And uh, uh, see, and the MLMs. And uh, so these the, the were major acquisitions. So see how our collection has grown. This is 2010. We had uh, 77,000 mount photographic or film negatives and uh, several photographic collections. Uh, this was the MLI collection, 8,700, uh, 1,300 references. So this was kind of a stack of stuff that we're getting. And we outgrew uh, a DS, a room that we had it in. And uh, oh, uh, one thing I want to mention is, was a project that uh, uh, 
Uh, Ken Phipps conceived of and actually uh, ran. I don't know how many how many how many uh, uh, sets of cars did you sell, Ken? Do you I, I do not. Uh, it was a nice nice project. It didn't it wasn't didn't make us rich really, but it but it, but we, it was a contribution. It was a nice thing. Ken uh, put 55 unique photos that he uh, he found picked out of the collection, got a fitting uh, caption to them, and we used this logo on the back of the, the card, and you got sponsors to uh, pay for each other, they were paid, and then it was able to sell $10, and that one there? Yeah. yeah. And it was a nice, it was a nice project. We, we just needed five or six more projects. <laughs> Somehow. Uh, about the time, not too long before, I had to quit. Dick Manning joined in, in a big way, and he, OCR, copied all the MLMs and other bound publications. He organized these, made these retrievable from an archive. It's a great job. We used a, a rather sophisticated Hewlett Packard uh, scanner to do this, and he, he did it. And, uh, that he supervised the digital copying and identification of the archival storage of the mountain negatives. And one, I think, <laughs> you, you did a million and one of the negatives. <laughs> and and, uh, 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 and Dick organized this into an archive. And I'm not sure just where it uh, stands right now. I'm sure it's, it's been developed even more. We, uh, uh, these are the grants we received the MMA up to the time I was I left, and if so, so from 2001 to 2010, these are various contractors who paid back part of their fee to various organizations that we were considered one. So you see, these are in the order of uh, the BWXTO, CHM Hill, Stoller. And uh, the any division of DOE had a fund that they gave us to to uh, support uh, work on RTGs, and that's was distributed over some four years. Uh, so they were the order of ten thousand dollars. They also didn't make us rich, but they kept us going. Uh, oops. Uh, so in 2012, we ended up with these activities, these work sessions, the monthly technical presentation. We, we had an open house, usually in December, took over the mound uh, annual dinner. Uh, see, I put that on another slide. I think it was 2008 when we did that. And uh, uh, we had special admissions and tours here for different occasions had a gift shop when the museum was open, and we had some joint projects for a while in the right state. This is the first uh, museum. We first moved in the front end of the GH building here, and this was called 500 Vantage Point, then was the address. Uh, oops. This is the second home. This is uh, this building here, and uh, this is 10,075. Well, we finally got all of GH building first in, in uh, 2006. And uh, then, uh, so it's a it kind of a summary. We initiated this effort in 1998 and formed the MMA in 2000, incorporated in 2000, May 26. The first selection of officers in 2002, 2003, moved to the small portion of GH. Uh, we had a second election in 2005 in June. We occupied the entire building of GH in 2006. MMA assumed management of the Mount Dinner in 2008. Uh, the third election of officers in 2008, and we moved into one of building 102, this building here in uh, April of 2010. And we had two th about 200 members at the end of 2010. So this is 
where I sort of lose and attract the things that I had to leave the organization. So that's my account of the early years. And thank you, Don, for your, your uh, allowing us to show again your, your presentation on the formation of the, of the Mound uh, Science Museum Association uh, as a remembrance of the roles, people, and mission of the Mound Laboratory throughout, from the time of World War II up until uh, uh, into the 20th cent, 21st century. Uh, I wanted to point out that we have a historical marker that uh, summarizes the uh, Mound Laboratory's existence that is located on Mound Road in Mimesburg, Ohio. So it's right at the entrance to the main site. So, uh, but we also point out that there's a the museum now, the Cold, Mound Cold War Discovery Center that was renovated and now operated by Dayton History. And it's available uh, uh, for free to visit. It includes many artifacts from the um, Mound uh, history, several of which Don had talked about in his presentation, as well as an uh, overview of missions and things related to uh, nuclear technology for space and other applications. So it's a very worthwhile. It is free. It's open Wednesday through Saturday. And uh, please check out their website or come visit and, and learn more about the uh, important uh, atomic facility that was located in Minersburg, Ohio. Now, the Mount uh, Science and Energy next webinar presentation will be on October 28th. This is titled, A Conversation with Betty Howie Jones. Ms. Jones uh, worked at, a, at the Dayton Project in World War II and then continued at Mount Laboratory for over 30 years. This uh, interview was recorded uh, in cooperation with the Oakwood Historical Society back in June of 2019. And it's a unique opportunity to learn from firsthand experience of, of a person involved uh, in the Dayton Project and with Mound. And with that, we'd like to close for tonight. We hope you uh, enjoyed our presentation and look forward to continuing to share the history of Mound Laboratory and the uh, missions related to it with you.